All right, so today is Saturday, June 23rd, 2018. We're live. Hey, this is Michael in Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecturer, and writer. Hope everybody's doing well today. We're broadcasting once again uh, using Zoom, so checking out this uh, technology. But I wanted to talk about this story. Uh, I saw it when I was in uh, Atlanta. Um, last uh, weekend, okay? So I was in um, Atlanta for the Juneteenth celebration, uh, three-day Juneteenth celebration last weekend, uh, June 15th through the 17th, okay? And uh, I saw an article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com, all right, dealing with uh, Nicki Minaj. And uh, it was about a big article she did with uh, L Magazine, L.com, E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, uh, which was published June 13th, uh, 2018, all right? And it talked about how uh, the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com talked about how uh, Nicki Minaj says she feels responsible for girls selling sex and create and creating quote unquote modern day prostitutes, modern day prostitutes. Okay. Uh, and I asked the question, what did you think was going to happen? Now, this is not an attack on Nicki Minaj or anything like that. All right. But I want to deal with this. So what I did was I read the article from um, AtlantaBlackStar.com and I read the uh, full interview from L.com and I just finished uh reading that full interview. I want to make sure that I went through and read the full interview uh, as opposed to just the um, article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, okay? So the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com is written by uh, Daryl Nelson, June 14, 2018. And uh, he picked up the um, article from L.com, uh, which was called uh, The Queen Returns, The Queen Returns by Devin Gordon written June, uh, published June 13th, 2018, all right? So everybody watching, share this broadcast on your Facebook page, invite your friends to tune in also, okay? Uh, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network. So this is not an attack on Nicki Minaj, all right? But we need to, we need to deal with this, okay? And I'm raising a daughter, my daughter's 15 months old, she doesn't know who Nicki Minaj is, and hopefully it's a long time <laughs> before she does, all right? So in this interview, uh, you know, uh, Nicki Minaj talks about her new, uh, uh, talks about her new CD coming out. Uh, she talks about being single for the first time uh, in a number of years since she says she's, since she was 15 years old, she's basically been in a relationship. Uh, it says she talks about being out of a relationship now uh, for about uh, six months, and she talks about a spiritual growth, uh, a spiritual growth since she is single. Uh, she said it took a while to function uh, being single, but once she realized she can function, she could breathe, she can eat, she can operate, uh, it gave her really a new sense of power and allowed her to um, really reconnect to herself. So she's 35 years old now. Uh, she talked about how uh, spiritually, I've experienced more growth in the last six months of my life, of my career, than I have in the last eight years, okay? Uh, the interviewer, uh, Devin Gordon, asked her, why do you think that is? She said, it's the first time in my life I've ever been single, okay? And she talked about how uh, from the age of 15 until last fall, she's always had a serious boyfriend, quote, six years, 12 years, three four okay she said over time this came to have consequences she did not anticipate all right and she said i remember feeling like i could do anything at one time in my life and somewhere along the line i just started second guessing myself for whatever reason okay she said as soon as i realized that i could actually live and breathe and eat and sleep and walk and talk without having a boyfriend something clicked in me all right so she talks about that. Then she talked, she also talked about the, uh, her name, right? So her real name is Onika Tanya Maraj, M-A-R-A-J, Onika Tanya Maraj, okay? And she talked about how an old manager uh, of hers uh, gave her that last name of Minaj, M-I-N-A-J, 
okay, Minaj. And um, we know last fall she was on the cover of uh, Paper Magazine, um, and it was the Break the Internet issue. And on that, in the photo spread, uh, on the cover and in the photo spread, it had three versions of Mickey, Nicki Minaj. And they were engaged, in the photo spread, they were engaged in a menage a trois with each other. This, this, this is what it says in the article when I saw the photo spread, okay? I'm not going to get into the details. You can read this yourself, all right? I ain't going to get into the sexual details, all right? So uh, she talks about how um, uh, she says she would never, uh, she says she would never apologize for her persona. Quote, I love being sexy. I'm never going to stop being an exhibitionist, end quote, okay? But it, too, has had consequences, consequences that she did not anticipate, okay? Now, one of her messages on her new uh, CD, on her new album, she says is, quote, it's being okay, it, it being okay to keep your legs closed. Quote, it being okay to keep your legs closed, end quote. And she's speaking, uh, she started speaking slower than usual as if she was searching for the way to preach self-respect without sounding like she is slut-shaming. Their words, not mine, okay? She said, quote, I don't really know how to say that without being offensive, end quote, all right? So she went on to say, quote, maybe I was naive, but I didn't realize how many girls were modern day prostitutes, end quote, or words, not mine. Quote, whether, you're, whether you are a stripper or whether you're an Instagram girl, these girls are so beautiful and they have so much to offer. But I started finding out that you give them, that you give them a couple thousand dollars and you can have sex with them. I was like, yikes. It's just sad that they don't know their worth. It makes me sad as a woman. And it makes me sad that maybe I've contributed to that in some way, end quote. All right, time out. Okay, <laughs> once again, like I said, this is not an attack on Nicki Minaj, right? But if you listen to her lyrics, and personally, I think Nicki Minaj is probably a very nice person. Never met her before. I think she's a very nice person. I do also understand that many times there's a difference. Having worked in radio, and I don't just mean the radio station I'm at now, 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, WFDF in Detroit, having worked in music radio years ago, having met entertainers, having met promoters, having met managers, things like this, having met promoters for record companies, I do know many times the persona of the artist that we see is different than who they actually are okay so i do understand this i, I do understand oftentimes the record company that managers create a persona to market okay so uh if you see some of her music videos like anaconda things like this right you see a very hyper sexualized image that's projected okay even um in other videos that she's in uh, uh, that where she's singing, rapping the hooks and things like this. You see, you're oftentimes scantily dressed, uh, sexually charged lyrics, okay? Uh, rake it up, things like this. You see there was a lot of behind shaking, et cetera, right? So even though it was unintended, okay? And I don't think she was purposely trying to corrupt uh, young girls, especially African-American girls, they watch that and 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 they want to be Nicki Minaj. They want to dress like her. They want to wear her hairstyle. They want to talk like her. They want to rap like her. Okay. So if you read some of her lyrics, and we'll get to some of her lyrics for Anaconda in just a minute, which is one of her biggest hits, uh, it's almost impossible to think that this is not going to have an impact on young, impressionable girls especially african-american girls whatever is disseminated becomes imitated whatever is disseminated becomes imitated your thoughts create feelings your feelings create actions and behaviors your actions and behaviors create results okay this is extremely important this is why i've been studying media for 26 years this is why i talk about the negative uh effect and the negative impact that media has okay this this is this is a perfect example of this okay your thoughts create feelings your feelings create actions and behaviors. Your actions and behaviors create results. What you read, see, and hear 
uh, impacts and affects the way you think, feel, act, and behave, okay? All right. Okay, everybody share this broadcasting and Facebook page. We'll put this on our YouTube channel also, okay? All right, so let's continue here. Um, so uh, the interviewer, Devin Gordon for Elle Magazine, went on to ask Nicki Minaj, are you reckoning with that now more than you have in the past, okay? The impact that she has on young, impressionable girls, okay? Nicki Minaj responded, she said, quote, I've always felt like it, but in a lot of ways, I don't know if I'm doing the same thing they're doing, okay? I've always felt like it, but in a lot of, way, a lot of ways, I don't know if I'm doing the same thing they're doing because I'm selling sex appeal. So I can't look down on these girls. I may not be having sex with people, but I'm still selling sex appeal, end quote, okay? And she talked about being abstinent. I think in one of her uh, new songs, she, she talks about uh, being uh, abstinent as well. Uh, we'll find, I'll find that uh, exact quote for you, okay? All right, but she goes on to say, um, uh, so Devin Gordon, the interview, asked her, well, sex and sex appeal aren't, aren't the same thing. This is, what he, this is what he says. Well, sex and sex appeal aren't the same thing. Nicki Minaj responds, that's true, but I just don't know if girls who look up to me think that when I'm posting a sexy picture, I'm actually the antithesis of all of that. She's saying she's the opposite, really, of the image that's being projected of her. And this is where we have to have these conversations with our youth and explain the difference between reality and this persona that's being projected, okay? Nick, Nicki Minaj is a persona that has been uh, created for her, okay? All right, so she said, that's true, but I just don't know if girls uh, look up to me uh, look, I, I don't know if girls who look up to me think that when I'm posting a sexy picture. I'm actually the antithesis of all of that. I'm more of like the snobby girl, like the uh, what type of uh, uh, what type of girl, and and I want the girls to be like. Uh, she said, "I'd rather you be called snobby or a b-word or conceited. I'd rather you be called that than easy." A whole or, you know, a slut. Okay, her words, not mine. All right. So um, this article was published June 13th, this interview, June 13th, 2018 for L.com, L Magazine. And um, I encourage people to read the entire article. AtlantaBlackStar.com has an article they picked up uh, about uh, an excerpt of the article, Nicki Minaj says she feels res responsible for girls selling sex and creating quote unquote modern day prostitutes written by um, Daryl Nelson, June 14th, 2018. Okay. Um, she also talked about uh, being abstinent and see if I can find that. Uh, okay. So let's see, what does she get into that? I've got it here. All right. So she says, uh, uh, Nikki says you can hear it on the album when she raps it. So she's talking about her new CD. All right. Uh, let's back up. Uh, okay. She talks about becoming single. Um, she goes on. Uh, becoming single was one of the things that made me feel strong and powerful. She's been single basically six months now, approximately. Uh, the fact that I am a young woman who doesn't need a man for money. I don't need a man for a job. I never have to have sex for beats, you use a different word. I never had I never had to have sex for a record deal. I don't have those pressures. I get up when I want, shop when I want, end quote, okay? Um, it, then it goes on to say, Nikki says you can hear it on the album when, when she raps about, quote, abstaining from sex, had to zen, Z-E-N, my body. Abstaining from sex, had to zen, my body. I ain't given, so don't ask. I don't lend my body. He got to be king status to get in my body, end quote. So she's talking about having standards for a man to have sex with her. 
She's talking about having some type of state. He got to be king status to get in my body. OK, so this is the new spiritually awakened, evolved Nicki Minaj. Right. Well, let's go back and look a few years ago <laughs> at the lyrics to the song Anaconda. OK, now I've talked about this in um, uh, a presentation that I did called Empire Strikes Black, the propaganda of the media. Empire Strikes Black, the propaganda of the media. OK, and Anaconda came out about 2015. And I don't listen to, uh, to uh, I don't listen to uh, 2014, okay? Um, I, I don't listen to a whole lot of hip hop. I listen to it enough to know what's out there. So I watch music videos and I try to watch the video just one time. So I might watch BET uh, jams or um, uh, with Fuse TV or something like that. So, so I just watch it enough to know what's out there, okay? Um, but I found out about the song Anaconda from listening to the, um, I found out about the video Anaconda from listening to the Tom Jones Morning Show a few years ago. And the video had been viewed like a hundred million times in 30 days, something crazy like that, right? So I heard them talking about, I heard Tom and, and Huggy Lowdown and J. Anthony Brown, I heard them talking about the video. Now, I, I had heard the song on the radio, the uncensored version, but I hadn't seen the video because I don't just sit up and watch music videos back to back like that all day you know you all know i watch msnbc i got msnbc going on right now it's just muted okay so i went on youtube to watch the video and i was blown away because that video looks like soft core pornography that's what the video looks like okay so in the so then i i, I go to az lyrics so if you want to know if you want to get the lyrics to a song parents you need to read the lyrics of the songs that our children are listening to, okay? All right, so go to azlyrics.com, azlyrics.com. You can type in the name of an artist. You can type in the name of pretty much any song, and um, it'll give you the lyrics to the song, right? So if we look at Anaconda, okay, here's some of the lyrics. Boy toy named Troy used to live in Detroit. Big dope dealer money, he was getting some coins. Was in shootouts with the law, but he lived in a palace. Bought me Alexander McQueen, he was keeping me stylish. Now that's real, real, real. Gun in my purse, B, I came dressed to kill. Who wanna go first? I, ha I had him pushing daffodils. I'm high as hell, I only took half a pill. So she's probably talking about ecstasy. You know, so but if you if you read it now, this is the first this is just like the first verse after the chorus. My anaconda, you know, don't want none unless you got bun hun, buns, huh? She sampled Sir Mix a lot, right? But she's talking about being with a man because he buys her designer clothing, Alexander McQueen. Okay. She's talking about being with a not just a man, a drug dealer. Okay, so what happens when our children Girls and boys, what happens when they hear this over and over and over again on the radio? We're not even talking about them watching the music video because, see, the music videos are worse. I mean, the music today is much worse, more dangerous than the music in the 80s. It's not just the lyrics. It's the proliferation of music videos. See, in the 80s and early 80s, you start having the music videos come out. You have, you know, Tony Basil and Mickey, which is one of the very first music videos, okay? But we didn't have YouTube in the 80s. Well, you can go on and you can watch any music video and don't need cable, okay? You can watch it on your smartphone. We didn't have all that in the 80s, okay? So the lyrics aside, you have more access to more dangerous music today. OK, so when our girls, especially African-American girls, hear Nicki Minaj, who for many of them is their idol, don't know why, but many of them, she's their idol. She is talking about being she's talking about being with a man because he's a drug dealer and he can buy her expensive designer clothing. When African-American boys, especially African-American boys hear this, what is this? OK, so they're saying, OK, well, if I have this money, if I sell drugs, then I can get a woman like, like Nicki Minaj. 
this is a trophy wife. This is a trophy. This is, you know, this is a trophy uh, woman. Okay. If I'm making money, I can buy her designer clothing. I can have a woman like Mickey, Nicki Minaj. But what this does is surreptitiously, surreptitiously, covertly, this encourages African American boys to turn to criminality to get money to get a woman like Nicki Minaj. This is not an attack on her. We got to understand the attack on us. And we have to understand how negative corporate hip hop is used to attack, to, uh, to capture, and to destroy the minds of African American youth. This is what this is about. Now, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard this before, disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about, right? And for those, and for those in the Detroit area, I want to know. I want you to know. Coming up Thursday, June 28th, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Jam Handy in Detroit, the uh, the Minister of Information for the legendary hip hop group Public Enemy, Professor Griff, will be here in Detroit because they're celebrating the 30th year anniversary of one of the greatest CDs albums in hip hop history. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Okay. This is taking place at the jam handy 2900 East grand Boulevard, Detroit, Michigan, 7 PM to 10 PM Thursday, June 28th. You got Kari uh, Frazier who they'll be, be, be there performing. You got a uh, Khalid, Khalid El Hakim with the uh, Black Mobile Museum one on one. All this is going on. For more information and to purchase tickets, go to go to DetroitIsDifferent.com. DetroitIsDifferent.com. Okay, and we'll have Professor Griff on uh, my radio show, the African History Network show, Sunday night, June twenty fourth. I'm on nine p.m. to eleven p.m. Eastern Standard Time on nine ten a.m. The Superstation in Detroit. We'll broadcast here on Facebook. All right, but Professor Griff. He talks about this. Professor Griff, he's in the music industry. He still performs with, with public enemy. All right. So we have to understand this. We have to understand the attack that is that is taking place against African American youth. Because if you don't understand the attack, then you don't know how to have these conversations with them or really the need to have these conversations with them. And you don't know to fight against this. Okay? So even though I'm not, this is not an attack on Nicki Minaj, but we have to understand that we are under attack. African-Americans are under attack, okay? Our youth are under attack. And if you want to destroy a nation, if you want to destroy a nation, you do it through the music because the music hits the youth first. If you want to destroy a nation, you do it through the music because the music hits the youth, youth first and the youth are the ones most vulnerable because they're the ones usually least indoctrinated in their history and culture. So the defenses are the weakest to fight against this, okay? So here we have boy toy named Troy, used to live in Detroit, big dope deal of money. He was getting some coins, okay? So then, um, she, so she goes on and she talks about, um, let's see, let's scroll down. Okay, this dude named Michael used to ride motorcycles. Penis bigger than a tower. I ain't talking about Eiffels. Real country as N word. Let me play with his rifle. Talking about sex. P word put his ass to sleep. Now he calling me NyQuil. Now that bang, bang, bang. Pay attention. She said, I let him hit it because he slang cocaine. Wait a second. You talk about in the previous verse, you talk about being with Troy, who used to live in Detroit, who was a drug dealer. And he bought you Alexander McQueen. He was keeping you stylish. Now you're talking about a dude named Michael who used to ride motorcycles. You let him hit it, have sex with you because he was selling cocaine. He tossed my salad like his name, Romaine. And when he done, I make him buy me Balmain. Some more designer clothing. So wait a second. Hold on. You talk. It sounds like I don't mean to indict the sister. I love Nikki. I think she's a. I think she's probably very nice. But it sounds like you're talking about prostituting yourself. I'm. This, I'm sorry. That, that's what, it. Sounds like you're talking about prostituting yourself. Also, you're talking about being with drug dealers. So. This, you gotta understand, Anaconda. Go research Anaconda. This was one of her biggest hits. 
Watch the, watch the video Anaconda on YouTube. So what impact does this have on African-American girls who are impressionable and want to attract boys? And they see Nikki on, on, in music videos, they see her at the Grammys, they see her in Barbershop 3, they see her on the cover of magazines. And then you have African-American boys who see all this, right? And they say, well, wait a second. If I sell drugs, if I turn to criminality, if I get a lot of money, I can have a woman like Nikki. She says so in her music. So we have to understand how powerful this is. This is why we have to have these conversations with our youth. This is why parents should go to azlyrics.com, the letter A, the letter Z, lyrics, L-Y-R-I-C-S, azlyrics.com. Read the lyrics of these songs so you understand the programming that our children are being affected with so we can have these conversations with them to teach them, one, to stop listening to this garbage, Two, to understand how to separate fact from reality. Because see, the other thing, a lot of these hip hop artists, right? A lot of them are married. But in their music, they don't talk about marriage. You know, Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, a lot of them, you know, a lot, a, a lot of, when you study a lot of these artists, you know, T.I., a, a lot of these artists, a lot of these male hip hop artists, you know, are married. But oftentimes their music is talking about promiscuity. But oftentimes their music is not talking about marriage, but they're married in real life, many of them. That's another thing. You're married, but your music is not promoting marriage. Okay, so check out the check out the words to uh, uh, Anaconda. All right. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, I let him hit it because he's slaying cocaine, right? Another example talking about uh, uh, being with a drug dealer, having sex with a drug dealer. All right, so check out the rest of that. Then uh, let me see which other lyrics that I have up here. Another another uh, song to check out, I Endorse These Strippers with uh, Tigger and uh, Thomas Brinks. Check that out also, azlyrics.com. It's another song from Nicki Minaj, I Endorse These Strippers, okay? And then uh, they have a, they have dozens of songs heard about her. The lyrics there you can check out. Okay, uh, you can check that. Okay, those are just two to check out from Nicki Minaj. All right. Okay, so let's continue here. We'll come to some of your comments here in just a minute. All right. Okay, so now with her spiritual awakening, now she's been out of relationship for six months. Okay, and now on her CD. She's talking about, quote, abstaining from sex had to zen, my body, Z-E-N. I ain't giving, so don't ask. I don't lend my body. He got to be king status to get in my body. So she has some stats. She, she has some standards that she's talking about, openly talking about. All right. So from the start of her career, Nikki has defined herself in opposition to the male dominated rap industry with a mix of mega talent and boisterous sex appeal. In her verse on the song Monster, uh, she lobbies Kanye and his then girlfriend Amber Rose for a threesome. Okay, uh, on the song Friday, she, uh, she specifies consulting her calendar. Uh, at one point, she says she hated the name Minaj, M I N A J. Uh, like I said, she was born Onika Tanya Moraj, M A R A J, and an old manager rechristened her, uh, but she's evidently made her peace with it. Uh, okay, so, and then they talk about the um, uh, cover of Paper Magazine, Breaking the Internet. Uh, it, it was called Having a Menage a Trois, uh, and it had three different images of Nicki Minaj engaged in sex acts with each other. You can read the rest of that. I'm not going to get to that. All right. Okay. So, they also talk about uh, B for Her and Cardi B, whatever. All right. So, Okay, so let's go to some of your comments here. Um, oh, in the, in the article from AtlantaBlackStar.com, they go on to say um, she's taken a few pages out of the Lil' Kim rap book of success by using sex to possibly get the attention of those closed-minded male listeners who may otherwise be indifferent to uh, female rappers' music. Uh, songs like Anaconda, Slumber Party, and the Lil' Wayne-assisted uh, high school um, 
are just some of the songs where Nicki Minaj spits some some of the over top uh, over the top sexually charged lyrics. OK, so it'll be interesting to see how people respond to her comments about some of today's uh, women promoting sex. Will they applaud her for saying she had a role in it or accuse her of being so righteous righteous? OK, and, you know, I, I think people can have a spiritual awakening and see the error in their ways, et cetera. So it's going to be interesting to see what she does about that. All right. Let's go to some of your comments here. Um, and uh, let me post this here. OK. Uh, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can uh, listen to over 850 of our audio podcasts. My DVD lectures are there also. You can connect you to our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. And um, also, you know, I teach online courses. We'll post the information here. We have a 10-course bundle pack, uh, which includes a 14-hour, seven-session online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet. The Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in the school. We deal with thousands of years of history, thousands of years of African history, and uh, also, you also get great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, uh, African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump. So these are um, online courses, they're all on demand. It's 10 in the bundle pack on sale, $60, regularly $130. We posted the link here. You can register for that. You can start watching as soon as you register. And um, it's also available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com on our homepage. If you need me to post a link again, let me know. Let's go to some of your comments. So Chike Akua. Hey, Chike Akua. My man, Dr. Chike Akua, we're in the documentary series Black Friday together. What's up, Chike? Um, to a Chika. Uh, he said, Nicki Minaj was deeply moved by the music of gospel singer Tasha Cobbs. Leonard, uh, this time last year, Minaj collaborated on uh, one of Tasha, Cobb, Tasha Cobb's uh, songs. They have become good friends. Uh, perhaps this, along with natural maturity, is affecting her thinking. And, and possibly, she also talks about, in the interview from Elle, because I went and read the entire interview, um, she talked about being single for the first time in years, really for the first time since she was 15 years old. She's 35 now. Uh, she's been single for like six months, gave her a time for quietness, time for self-reflection. Okay. So, uh, but Tasha Cobbs, Leonard may have something to do with it as well. Okay. Terry Jackson said controversy sales. She wanted to become famous and rich, did what she did, uh, did, did what she needed to do. Uh, I can't name one of her songs, never listened to her music. She was seeking stardom. She had she had an epiphany. Uh, we got Tara, Tara Lloyd. And everybody share this broadcast. Have your, uh, have your children watch this also, okay? Uh, MC Elder said, wishing you and uh, all uh, from Africa, from those of us, okay. All right, thanks. Uh, Willie Holman said hello from West Memphis, Arkansas. Doing excellent. We got Slick Rick Talbert. How are you doing? Shannon, peace and love. Uh, Divine Warren said, I don't think no one particular person can consider themselves the ones to start this particular problem. She's definitely not the first one to sell sex. I, I, and uh, reading the entire article, she didn't, she didn't say she thinks she's the one who started this. But she's talking about the fact that she thinks she has contributed uh, to this, okay? And she's basically the biggest female hip hop. And so you have Cardi B, but Cardi B doesn't have the longevity of a Nicki Minaj, okay? Uh, so Cardi B, yeah, she's number one on Billboard, all this stuff. We'll see how long that lasts. Okay, um, Lee Gregory said, if if you folks haven't seen the 2006, 2007 version of Nicki Minaj and Drake, you would not realize that she sold her soul, okay? Uh, I like Nicki, always have. Who's throwing stones? That's what Omar Wally said. Nobody's throwing stones. We're done with the interview that she did. I encourage you to read the entire interview at L.com, E-L-L-E, from L Magazine. It's entitled The Queen Returns. The Queen Returns, written by Devin Gordon, published June 13th, 2018. Okay, um, Shannon said, I like that whatever is disseminated is created. No, whatever is disseminated becomes imitated. Whatever is disseminated becomes imitated, okay? This is the power of the media. You have six multinational media corporations that control 90% of what you read, see, and hear. 
You have Walt Disney, CBS Corp, Comcast, um, News Corp, which owns the Fox News Network, the cable network, and the Fox TV network, which shows Empire, one of the most degrading uh, TV shows on the air right now. Then you have Viacom and Time Warner. You have six multinational media corporations that control 90% of what you read, see, and hear. They're basically controlling what is within the circumference of your own awareness, okay? And what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you have been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay, so Willie Holman said, I kind of think Nicki Minaj is probably a nice person as well. She seems to have been led astray uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, misappropriate behavior that negatively affected uh, or is affecting uh, our black uh, young females. Um, find another popular approach that is positively effective, positively effective slash effective on our young black females. Cynthia A. Pullen uh, said, don't want to be, I don't want to be called a B. I totally agree with you. I don't refer to our sisters as B word and hoes and um, thoughts and things like that. See, we have to be very careful about the terminology we use. When you use, and see, this is the same thing going on with the, immigration issue at the border and Donald Trump is using negative pejorative terms. He referred to MS-13 as animals. He started doing that a few weeks ago. That precipitated, that precipitated this really the, 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 this new policy. Okay. And he's using negative terminology. Okay. For, uh, this, this group, this group of people, undocumented immigrants, they're still human beings. He's attacking their humanity. He's talking about infestations. He's talking about the borders being overrun, okay? He's trying to associate crime with undocumented immigrants. But when you actually read the studies, the studies show, even, even government studies show that undocumented immigrants create crimes at a lower rate than uh, people who were born here in the U.S., all right. So what he's trying to do is use negative pejorative terms to attack people's humanity, to reduce their humanity, reduce them to the level of something subhuman. So then you can justify their mistreatment because they're not treating white undocumented immigrants like this. They're not doing this at the Canadian border where you have white undocumented immigrants coming in. Reverend Al Sharpton talked about this on Politics Nation this past week, I'm not, not on his radio on his radio show, keeping it real this past week. He said they're not they're not doing this at the Canadian border where you have white undocumented immigrants coming in. And we also know that about 42% of undocumented immigrants fly over here. They're not crossing the Mexican border. About 42% of undocumented immigrants fly over here. They come legally, they overstay their uh they overstay their visas and then they become undocumented. But they're not being mistreated and dehumanized largely like this, okay? Only those who are quote unquote brown, Hispanic, and coming through that Mexican border are not all Mexicans, okay? You have them coming from Central America, you have them coming from South America, you have them coming from the Caribbean. You have some African immigrants and African immigrants from the Caribbean, things like this, coming through there also, okay? And I know you got some people who want to say, oh, Hispanics are classified as white. Really prove it. What documentation are you citing that all Hispanics are classified as white? And if you look at the way they're being treated, they sure as hell ain't being treated like they're white. They're being treated more like black people than they are like they're white. But if you go back to, I think it was January this year, what did Trump say? He was in a meeting about immigration around January 9th. He's in a meeting about immigration and dealing with DACA, deferred access on childhood arrival. And he referred to immigrants coming from Africa, El Salvador, and Haiti as S-hole countries. You put, these ne you put this negative terminology on people so then you can attack their humanity. And when you understand history, this is the same thing that happened to African people with the transatlantic slave trade. Our, our, our humanity had to be attacked. They said we were savages, heathens, pagans. They said we were non-Christians and they justified the mistreatment, the enslavement for perpetuity, the selling off of children, the separation of children. 
They justified all this by putting these negative terms on us. They put the term negro on us, okay? Same thing happened to the Moors when they get conquered, because you're going to have some Moors who, when they lose control in Spain, some of them are going to be enslaved, and they're taken to territories that Spanish own. They're taken into Florida, because that was Spanish territory. Juan, Juan Ponce de Leon, the Spanish conquistador, comes into Florida in 1513. They take them into uh, South Carolina also, because the Spanish were enslaving Africans in the, day, in the territory we call South Carolina, going back to the 1520s. This is 100 years before Jamestown, Virginia, 1619. So and if, when you read um, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome by Dr. Joy DeGroote, she talks about cognitive dissonance. And she talks about how uh, you relabel a people, you relabel a people with negative terms to then justify their mistreatment, OK, to remove the remorse, to absolve yourself of any guilt. Because you're saying, oh, well, they're not human anywhere. They're just animals. They're not human. These are Negroes, what have you. They're not human. They're not like us. You just had uh, the host of uh, one of the co-hosts of uh, Fox and Friends, uh, Friday morning, I think it was, who said, well, it's not like they're doing it to people from Idaho or, or children from Idaho or Texas. They're saying, no, these children are not like us. OK, yeah, it's bad, but it's not like we're doing it to our own. This, these are still human beings. These are still human beings. Now, some Hispanics uh, classify themselves as Hispanic, but also classify themselves as white. But why is that? Who are Hispanics? Hispanics are a mixture of Europeans, especially Spaniards, Native Americans and Africans. They are a mixture of that, okay? Who were they conquered by? Spain. That's why they speak Spanish. Who were we conquered by in this country? England. That's why we speak English. Now, the sooner you realize all of this comes out of white supremacy and racism, and white supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other so they can fight against each other so the 1% stays in power, the sooner people can wake, wake up. So, but the majority of Hispanics don't classify themselves as white and white people, majority of them don't look at Hispanics as white. If they were, they wouldn't be treating them like they are at the border. Most of Donald Trump supporters don't look at Hispanics as white. If they looked at Hispanics as white, then why do you have the fear of the browning of America? And that's what all this is about. This is the fear of the browning of America because the undocumented immigrants that fly over here are not mistreated like that. It's a, it's, it's a focus on the Mexican border. It's a focus on the Mexican border, okay? This, and this is what Donald Trump tapped into. He tapped into a fear of the browning of America. I'm gonna do another broadcast. We'll talk about it tomorrow night. If you look at the study that just came out this past week, New York Times, June 20th, 2018, fewer births than deaths among whites in majority of US states. This is what this is all about. Fewer births than deaths among whites in majority of U.S. states. We posted the article here from MSN.com, right here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Make sure you follow us on our fan page, the African History Network, and make sure you turn on the notifications to uh, let you know when we broadcast live, all right? And this is dealing with how the Census Bureau has projected that whites could drop below 50% of the population around the year 2045 a relatively slow moving change that has been years in the making. But a new report this week found that whites are dying faster than they are being born now in 26 states, which is up from just of up from 17 states just two years earlier. And demographers say that shift might come even sooner. And you have a lot of now this is not an attack on anybody, but you have a lot of white people who fear losing a numerical majority in this country. Why? Because they know for, for, for decades and actually going back hundreds of years, especially 246 years, they know that they have mistreated numerical so-called minorities. And many of them fear that if they become a numerical minority, 
then what they did to others will come back on them. This is what many of them have a fear of, about. This is not an attack on anybody. I'm not advocating mistreating anybody. I'm talking about a fear that exists here. And this, this, this study documents this. People need to read this article. New York Times had an article about this. AtlantaBlackStar.com had an article about this. I can document this. When we look at why Donald Trump became president besides the Russian intervention, okay, which is documented, okay, besides all of that, it was a fear of cultural anxiety. Atlanta Black, uh, the, the Atlantic.com, the Atlantic.com, uh, May 9th, 2017, had an article. It was cultural anxiety that drove white working class voters to Trump. Cultural anxiety. Another word for cultural anxiety is white supremacy. A new study finds that fear of societal change, not economic pressure, motivated votes for uh, Donald Trump among non-salaried workers without college degrees. He's talking about the fear that many white people have. OK, this is not attacking white people who have this fear. This is dealing with these societal changes and how Donald Trump manipulated them to prey on their fears. OK, and now he's screwing them over. All right. Then Vox.com, V-O-X, Vox.com had an article from December 15th, 2017. So the first one was from May 19th, 2017. Next one, December 15th, 2017. The past year of research has made it very clear, Trump won because of racial resentment. Trump won because of racial resentment. Another study produces the same findings we've seen over and over and over again, okay? Uh, over at the Washington Post, researchers Matthew Fowler, Vladimir Madencia, and Kathy Coyne have published the results of a new survey on these questions with a focus on the 41% of white millennials, 41% of white millennials who voted for Trump and the sense of quote unquote white vulnerability, white vulnerability, they, that motivated them. The conclusion is very clear. Contrary to what some have suggested, white millennial Trump voters were not in more economically precarious situations than non-Trump voters. White millennial Trump voters were not in more economically precarious situations than non-Trump voters. Fully 86% of them reported being employed, a rate similar to non-Trump voters, and they were 14% less likely to be low income than white voters who did not support Trump. They were 14% less likely to be low income than white voters who did not support Trump. Employment and income were not, I repeat, employment and income were not significantly related to that sense of white vulnerability. So what was it? It was racial resentment. It was racial resentment. This is not an opinion. This is based upon the facts, based upon the studies. Even when controlling for partisanship, ideology, region, and a host of other factors, white millennials fit Michael Tesler's analysis explored here. As he put it, economic anxiety. Economic anxiety is not driving racial resentment. Rather, racial resentment is driving economic anxiety. Racial resentment is driving economic anxiety, a fear of the browning of America, a fear of a cultural change in America. These, Trump said, make America great again. They wanted to go back to Mayberry and Ain't B and Andy Griffith and Barney and Opie. You watch that show, you don't see any black people, except in non-speaking roles, except for one brother who was Opie's football coach. They wanted to go back to Ward and Beaver Cleaver, Ward and June Cleaver, Leave it to Beaver. They want to go back to Ozzie and Harriet. You watch these shows, you basically don't see any African-Americans. This is prior to the Civil Rights Act of 64, prior to the Voting Rights Act of 65. This is the time that many of them wanted to go back to because they fear the browning of America. They fear cultural changes and societal changes in America. We found, as he has in a larger population, that racial resentment is the biggest predictor of white vulnerability. Racial resentment is the biggest predictor of white vulnerability among white millennials. Economic variables like education, income, and employment 
made a ne neg negligible difference, okay? Made a neg negligible difference, all right? So read the rest of this. Now, this is from Vox.com, V-O-X, Vox.com. The past year of research, they did an entire year of research. The past year of research has made it very clear Trump won because of racial resentment. Another study produces the same findings we've seen over and over and over again, okay? Then you look at May 8th, 2017, all right? The nation.com, the nation.com. Economic anxiety didn't make people vote Trump. Racism did. Economic anxiety did not make people vote Trump. Racism did. New data provide a compelling answer to the vexing question, okay? So you gotta, re you gotta research this, all right? So then, you see, so when you see this study that came out this past week, New York Times picked it up, Washington Post, AtlantaBlackStar.com, MSN.com, okay? We posted the article from MSN.com, has been liked about 1,500 times, all right? And, and we'll talk about this uh, Sunday night, on my radio show, the African History Network show, all right? Uh, America's white population shrinks for the first time as nation ages. America's white population shrinks for the first time as nation ages. This came out um, uh, uh, June 21st, 2018. The number of non-Hispanic white people in the United States decreased for the first time in the nation's history between 2015 and 2016, according to new figures released Thursday by the U.S. Census Bureau, okay? So Thursday was the 21st. The data show the nation's white population is aging rapidly as Americans delay their decision to have a family and as the flow of foreign immigrants from European countries ebbs or decreases. See, this is why Trump said we need to bring in more immigrants from places like Norway. He said, why we keep bringing these immigrants in from Africa, El Salvador, and Haiti? He called them S-hole countries. He said we need to bring in more people from, from countries like Norway because there's a decreasing number of immigrants coming from white countries. There's a declining birth rate of white people. And in 26 states, more white people are dying than are being born. And there's a whole fear around this, okay? At the same time, minority populations are growing much faster, hastening, a demo, hastening or speeding up a demographic shift that has been decades in the making. This is why people like Stephen Miller, who is a, a, a white supremacist, okay, and he is the one really behind the new policy. There's a policy change, new policy of separating uh, uh, children from their families, okay, coming across the Mexican border. Because they're not doing that to people coming across the Canadian border. Don't think undocumented immigrants don't come through the Canadian. They ain't doing that, come through the Canadian border. They're not doing that to them, all right? This is what this is all about. All right, and, and, and you should read the article, uh, rawstory.com had the article uh, about Stephen Miller, uh, something like 21 things you need to know about Stephen Miller, okay? Let me find that article, all right? But, but, but Stephen Miller, when he was at Duke University, his uh, mentor was Richard Spencer. Who is Richard Spencer? Richard Spencer is the founder of the National Policy Institute. Richard Spencer is the man who coined the term alt-right. Richard Spencer. Roland Martin debated Richard Spencer twice on uh, News One Now with uh, Roland Martin on TV One. Mopped up the floor with him. Okay? And, 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 and um, uh, Stephen Miller used to be an aide to um, U.S. Senator Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III, who's now the Attorney General who April 6th of this year announced this new policy change because um, Sessions is very, very anti-immigration, okay, uh, of non-European people, all right? So uh, people talked about how this is something uh, Sessions stayed on and took the abuse from Trump 
so he can implement these policies, okay? So he can implement these policies. Also check out this article from NBCnews.com, fact check. No evidence undocumented immigrants create more crimes. Fact check. No evidence undocumented immigrants uh, commit more crimes. This is from June 28, 2017, NBCnews.com. It's an absolute lie. And what, what Trump is doing is he's, he's putting out these lies to then justify the mistreatment of human beings, okay, to attack their humanity. And they're doing the same thing. They're doing the same thing to African Americans. This is what we have to understand, okay? If they treat Hispanics like this, how do you think they're treating us? Okay, and all this comes out of white supremacy. This is what this is what people fail to understand. All this comes out of white supremacy and racism. All right. Yeah, here's the article. These 21 facts explain exactly why Trump aides Stephen Miller. Uh, 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 Stephen Miller is so it is so horrible. These 21 facts explain exactly why a uh, Trump aides Stephen Miller is so horrible. All right. Uh, and then if we look at the article again from MSN.com, now that's from rawstory.com. You need to read that. June 19, 2018. Okay. We, uh, we go back to this article from MSN.com. America's white population shrinks for the first time as nation ages. The average non-Hispanic white American is 43 and a half years old. The average non-Hispanic white American, white American is 43 and a half years old, according to the new data. The average Hispanic American, by contrast, is 29.3 years old. Okay, so there's a, there's a huge fear. Trump and, and and his Republican followers, many of his aides, they are fanning the flames of this fear. Okay, uh, and they and they're using this to further divide America. At the same time. Republicans in the House, led by Paul Ryan, Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, are focusing on uh, gutting the social safety net, Medicaid, Medicare. They're talking about attacking Social Security, which is going to have a devastating effect on many poor white Republicans who voted for Donald Trump. This is going on at the same time. They're talking about gutting the social safety net, and they say they have to do it to pay for the $1.4 trillion tax cut that they passed, which gives 83% of the benefits to the top 1%. The whole, the whole thing is a joke. The whole, the whole thing is a joke. Okay? And they are um, uh, conning uh, poor whites to keep voting for them and they're passing laws that attack the very people that voted for. Okay, so let's go back to your comments here. Um, we posted an article from MSN.com. Let me post this article. Let me give, give you this article here from Raw Story as well uh, about Stephen Miller. Um, so these 21 facts explain uh, why Trump a Stephen Miller is uh, so horrible, okay? And it was ironic is that um, Kirsten Nielsen, Secretary of Homeland Security, who stood up there day after day, she was, did a, she was at the White House Press Secretary Conference a few days ago, press briefing, and said that only Congress could change this policy, okay? Said, said the president couldn't change it. Then Trump comes out with executive order to change what he created. She was at a, at, at, so after she did the press conference, right? And I think it was, um, it, was be, it was before Trump signed the executive order. She was at a Mexican restaurant and she was verbally chastised by a group of people saying shame, shame, shame. She's at the Mexican restaurant. Imagine this, wait a second. You, you have this policy at the Mexican border. Some of the people coming through are Mexicans. You're dehumanizing them but you go to a Mexican restaurant. Then, yesterday, Stephen Miller's at a Mexican restaurant. He gets chastised by a group of people also. What's with, what's with these people going to Mexican restaurants but want to attack Mexico and Mexicans? Hmm, I, I just find that very interesting. I find that very interesting. It's like you want to, uh, 
um, it's like you want to listen to black music, but attack black people. Or it's like um, uh, during the um, 50s and 60s, when you have white artists putting out covers of black people's music, because you don't want to have black people on your TV show, or you don't want them to perform, okay? You, you know, um, Pat Boone, Pat Boone, white artist, put out a cover of Tutti Frutti by Lil Richard. Lil Richard talks about this, man. He said, they put out covers of my music. You know, Pat Boone said, well, hey, it made the black artists more popular. They didn't ask you to put out a cover of their music. A lot of those covers were terrible too. You know, so they put out covers. I mean, if you look at Big Mama Thornton, Big Mama Thornton was the one that recorded Hound Dog before Elvis Presley recorded Hound Dog. Elvis Presley, Presley became rich. Big Mama Thornton died broke. So you study this history, you have this cultural appropriation. So you have you have them blocking, demonizing, dehumanizing Mexicans coming from the Mexican border, but you go to a Mexican restaurant to eat Mexican food. Interesting. Okay, so let's go back to some of your comments here. And if you like this type of information, you can donate to the African History Network uh, as well. Uh, we'll go to some of your comments here in just a minute here. You can donate to the African History Network also, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, okay? Uh, that helps us stay on the air, keep broadcasting, keep doing the research. Um, we'll post a link here. You can also uh, order our DVD lectures and uh, sign up for the online classes. All my courses I teach, they're all on demand. We have a bundle pack, uh, bundle pack of 10. Um, you're gonna sell $60 right now, regularly $130. Uh, and includes um, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And that is a 14 hour, seven session online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. Uh, it also includes um, another online class, Great African Women in History, the Mothers of Civilization, um, African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, voter suppression, reparations, and high elections are consequences, and um, some other ones as well as 10 in the bundle pack, okay? As soon as you register, you can start watching. You can watch from around the world. Okay, so uh, people, people can and said, let's talk about how to be better parents while we wasting our time talking about music. Uh, <laughs> you must have missed this presentation. You must have missed this broadcast if you said that. This ties, the music ties right into the children. The parents have to understand what the children are listening to. And even if your children are not listening to it, your friend's children probably are listening to it. So go back and watch this from the beginning. Okay, Erica said, uh, yes, that's the majority of undocumented immigrants flying temporary visas. Uh, well, we know 42% fly over here, about 42% fly over here, and they overstay their visas, then they become undocumented. They come in legally, okay? See, this is the other thing. So Trump is just telling, Trump is just really deceiving people about immigration, undocumented immigrants, and the Trump, administ Trump administration wants to reduce the number of legal immigrants as well, and they're targeting those non-European legal immigrants as well, okay? The other thing that is not being talked about is that um, uh, African uh, immigrants from African countries are the most educated people basically in the U.S., okay? This is the other thing that's not talked about, all right? Uh, there was an article from, um, where is that? I'll find that again. Uh, I know I talked about it a few months ago uh, on my show, uh, and um, there were a number of articles written about this. Let's see. Times.com. African immigrants are more educated than most, including people born in the U.S., uh, written by Ann Simmons, June, January 12, 2018. African immigrants are more educated than most, including people born in the U.S. Um, you could read that, uh, let's see here. Uh, drawing from US surveys and Census Bureau data, the report found that the majority come from five countries, Nigeria, Ghana, 
Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, and South Africa, okay? Overall, their numbers are uh, small compared with other immigrants, but have risen significantly in recent years. This is the previous paragraph. Uh, the, US the U.S. immigrant population from Sub-Saharan Africa, 49 countries with a total population of more than 1.1 billion, grew from 720,000 to more than 1.7 million between 2010 and 2015. The U.S. immigration population from Sub-Saharan Africa, okay, grew from 720,000 to more than 1.7 million between the years 2010 and 2015, according to a new report by New American Economy, a Washington-based research and advocacy group. Still, they make up just half of a percent of the U.S. population, half of a percent of the U.S. population, okay? Um, let's see. Uh, African immigrants were more than twice as likely than, than the U.S. population overall to work in health care. Uh, there are more than 32,500 nursing, psychiatric, or home health aides, more than 46,000 registered nurses, and more than 15,700 uh, 15, doctors and surgeons. Overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, the evidence shows that African immigrants make a significant positive economic contribution to the U.S. economy, both at the national level and in districts where they are concentrated. They contribute more than $10.1 billion in federal taxes, $4.7 billion in state and local taxes, and most importantly, they have significant economic clout to the point of $40.3 billion in spending power, $40.3 billion in spending power. All right. So check out this article. So when people talk about undocumented immigrants or immigration, period, they don't talk about the impact that the positive impact they have on the economy. They work. They pay taxes. They spend dollars. That has a positive impact on the economy. It's not just African immigrants. It's, it's immigrants in general. OK, but that is that side is not talked about when you actually do the research. OK, then you have. The root.com, the root.com. I'm not a big fan of some of the articles from the root or some of the people that write for the root, but even a broken clock is right twice a day. Uh, Angela Helm had an article from January 17, 2018. Africans are the most educated immigrants in, in the U.S. Africans are the most educated immigrants in the U.S. In fact, on average, African immigrants are better educated than the immigrant population as a whole and people born here in the United States. And they uh, cite the uh, LA Times report, okay, um, uh, as well. All right, research found that of the 1.4 million sub Saharan African immigrants who are 25 years uh, and older, 41% have a bachelor's degree. 41% have a bachelor's degree compared with 30% of all immigrants and compared to 32% of the US population. Imagine that. They're coming from S hole countries, according to Trump but they're more educated. 41, but look, of, of research found that of the 1.4 million sub-Saharan African immigrants who are 25 years old and older, 41% have a bachelor's degree compared with 30% of all immigrants, that includes Asians, and 32% of the U.S. born population. 32% of the U.S. born population has at least a bachelor's degree. 41% of uh, sub-Saharan African immigrants, 25 years or older, have a bachelor's degree. Of the 19,000 U.S. immigrants from Norway, of the 19,000 U.S. immigrants from Norway, a country Donald Trump reportedly told lawmakers is a good source of immigrants, 38% have college educations, okay? 38% have college educations, all right? So um, check this out also from the root.com. Uh, Africans are the most educated immigrants in the U.S., all right? But you wouldn't know this watching the television, now would you? You wouldn't, you wouldn't know that watching the television. Interesting, all right? Okay, and uh, did I post this article here? This is the one about the Stephen Miller. You can read uh, from rawstory.com rawstory.com, okay? Uh, these 21 facts explain exactly why Trump A. Stephen Miller is so horrible. 
Okay, their words, not mine. They provide, they, they provide evidence, okay? These 21 facts explain exactly why um, uh, Trump aide Stephen Miller is so horrible, all right? Okay, so you can check out the rest of that. Okay. All right, let's go to some more of your comments. Okay, so Bishop MB said, of course, they have a fear. We've all dealt with it, especially in the professional world. Uh, we got Kemet Throne. How's everybody doing? If you need me to post a link so you can register for the online courses, or if you need the link for PayPal again, let me know. Okay, I'll post it again. Letitia Allen said uh, backlash because of the first black president. Yeah, now Letitia is absolutely correct. And see, that's the other thing. There, um, Trump was, uh, it's not just the fear of the browning of America. It's also, it was a backlash by many white Americans, not all white Americans, but many white Americans to the first African-American president because John Hansen, there were two John Hansons, the black John Hansen was not president. He was the um, senator to Liberia and Liberia was founded in 1821 by the American Colonization Society, okay? So that's another conversation, all right? Go to africanhistorynetwork.com, click on read articles by Michael M. Hotep, read my article, uh, the black John Hansen was not president. I provide the evidence there. All right, so this was uh, for a lot of white people, this was a backlash to turn two terms of President Barack Obama as well. And all this is coming back and blowing up in their faces as well also. Okay, uh, Erica Watson said, wow, racial resentment. Uh, Renee, okay, she said Goober too, okay. <laughs> you talking about Andy Griffith? Okay, Goober, who was a cousin to Gomer Powell. All right. <laughs> Uh, Bishop uh, M.B. said, gone with the wind. Okay, so 1938, 1939, gone with the wind. You have Rhett Butler and Scarlett O'Hara. You have Hattie McDaniels playing the role of Mammy. She wins, she becomes the first African-American to win Best Supporting Actress. She becomes the first African-American to win an Oscar, period. She won for Best Supporting Actress in 1939 for her role of Mammy and Gone with the Wind, okay? Um, and that was one of the three main movies that um, portrayed the image of the happy slave. You have uh, uh, the movie Uncle Tom's Cabin, which comes out around 1912. It's about 28, 30 minutes long. Uh, shows a subservient, uh, older African-American slave called Uncle Tom. It was a black and white movie. You have February 8th, 1915. You have the movie The Birth of a Nation from D.W. Griffith, okay? And, uh, uh, you have that one that shows a uh, uh, the happy slaves uh, dancing for the master, performing for the master, things like that. Uh, you have that movie, and then um, you have uh, Gone with the Wind also. So those are some of the three main movies that help to uh, portray the image of the uh, of the happy slave. Okay, uh, because the movie Gone with the Wind takes place during slavery, uh, the Civil War, and uh, Reconstruction, period of 1865 to 1877, uh, the Reconstruction takes place during that period of time. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's continue here. Uh, they resent the fact that Black women are more educated too. Yes, so, so, so that refers to the uh, uh, that refers to the uh, study that came out showing that uh, a, a larger percentage of African-American women are um, enrolled in college um, than uh, any other group. Okay. And just a second here, we're getting a little distortion. Uh, there was an article from the root.com that uh, talked about this also. Okay, just a second. Are they going in and out? Okay, stand by. You should be able to hear me okay now. Okay, so the root.com uh, had an article that looked at a study um, and it dealt with how black women are the most educated. And let's see, let's pull up this article here. It's uh, from 2016. Um, Angela Bronner-Helm, 
June 5th, 2016, Black Women Now, the most educated group in the U.S. Black Women Now, the most educated group in the U.S. And it talks about how, uh, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, uh, between 2009 and 2010, African-American women earned 68% of all associate degrees awarded to Black students, as well as 66% of bachelor's degrees, 71% of master's degrees, and 65% of all doctorates awarded to African-American students. Uh, it, so it goes on to say, uh, by both race and gender, by both race and gender, a higher percentage of African-American women, 9.7%, are enrolled in college than any other group, topping Asian women at 8.7%, white women at 7.1 percent and white men at 6.1 percent. So what the study shows is that African-American women uh, have a, a, that by race and gender, uh, African-American women make up a larger percentage uh, enrolled in college than any other race of women. 9.7 percent of African-American women are enrolled in college, 8.7 percent of Asian women 7.1% of white women and 6.1% of white men are enrolled in college. Unfortunately, while African-American women may be the most highly educated, a recent study found that African-American women make up just 8% of private sector jobs and less than 2% of leadership roles, okay? Uh, and as of 2013, African-American women earn just 64%, uh, 64 cents to uh, uh, for uh, every dollar that a white man earns, while white women earn 78 cents, African American men 75 cents, Hispanic men 67 cents, and Hispanic women 54 cents. I think since 2013 has increased a little bit. Uh, I think now for African American women is 67 percent. Okay. All right, but it should be 100 percent because they're doing the same job. Okay, so that's from the root.com. We'll post the link to this article as well. Uh, let's look at some more of your comments here. Um, Bishop MB said they will select the least of theirs as long as it's not us, uh, still our work and slap their names on it with no problem. Uh, Leticia Allen said, I sometimes uh, don't believe white people were ever the majority. I think uh, they always fudge the numbers. Well, you have to look at census.gov, uh, census.gov, look at the 2010 census report, which shows the racial class classifications, which shows you what is determined white, because uh, people immigrating from North Africa are classified as white, even if, they're, if they are Nubians coming from Egypt or Sudan, they're classified as white, okay? Um, and then Arabs who come from the quote unquote Middle East, okay, Arabs are classified as white by the US government. So you have to look at the racial classifications to see what are they calling white. Go to census.gov, search for the 2010 census report, okay? I have it bookmarked here. We'll pull it up because I, 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 I've researched all this before. That's how I know this stuff exists. Um, it's race, overview of race and Hispanic origins. Overview of race and Hispanic origins, uh, census.gov, uh, 2010. Okay. And look at page three. Page three breaks down the, uh, racial classifications. This is at census.gov. Um, the definition of race categories used in, in the 2010 census quote unquote, white refers to a person having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East, or North Africa. North Africa? It includes people, uh, it, it includes people who indicated their race as quote unquote white or reported entries such as Irish, German, Italian, Lebanese, Arab, Moroccan from Morocco, North Africa, or Caucasian. They all get classified as white. Interesting. So over the course of time, what is determined white by the U.S. government has changed. 
because it wasn't until the end of World War II that Italians and Greeks became classified as white. Okay, and we know there was a time in the history of this country where the Irish were not considered white. Okay, so check so check that out. Um, it's 24 pages. You can download it also. I downloaded and printed it up some time ago. Census.gov overview of race and Hispanic origin, 2010 census. Look at page three. Okay. All right. So let's continue here. Okay, Erica said, very interesting. Uh, very gracious woman was Hattie McDaniel, said Renee. Hattie McDaniels also was one of the three women who portrayed Beulah, um, the uh, TV show Beulah, because on the radio show Beulah, Beulah was portrayed by a white man. The voice of uh, Beulah was uh, was a white man, okay? When it moves to TV, you had African-American women. Ethel Waters was another one who uh, played. They had a different woman each season. I think she stayed on like three seasons. Hattie McDaniels was one of the ones who, uh, who played Beulah, okay? All right. We'll post a link again here uh, for uh, a bundle pack for our online courses I teach. And they're all on demand. You can watch anytime, watch over and over again. It's 10 courses in the bundle pack on sale, $60, regularly 130 It includes uh, Ancient Kemet, one of the original names for Egypt, the Moors, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school. Okay. Uh, Mary said, okay, Shir Shirima said, but the Norwegians don't want to come here. Yeah, so there were stories talking about how um, the Norwegians don't want to come to the U.S., how uh, conditions are better largely in Norway, and a lot of them don't want to come to the U.S. May have something to do with Trump, don't know. Uh, it's possible. Uh, Mary uh, Bowie said, thank you. I was saying that uh, saying that, but people were looking at me like I was crazy. So what were you saying, Mary, that people were looking at you like you were crazy and telling Michael M. Hotep said that you're not crazy. Gregory Jones said the Europeans negative birth rate is a global phenomenon uh, directly related uh, to recessive genetics. Okay, so he's dealing with science and um, he's dealing with dominant genetics and recessive genetics. You're not talking about one human being being superior and another human being being superior, but we're talking about genetics. And we're talking about recessive genes and dominant genes. Uh, Leticia Allen said, too many other cultures, red, yellow, brown, and black, people remember uh, Latinos classify themselves as white. Uh, how many people did that? Black people were not human. Okay, now when did Latinos as a group classify themselves as white? What are you referring to? What are you referring to? Was this a classification they made up themselves or this is a classification from the U.S. government? Because see, when Mustafa Hefni, who was Nubian, who's a Nubian from Egypt, he's, he's, he's of African descent. When he immigrated to the U.S. in 1978, he said that uh, uh, they gave him his immigration papers and they said, you are white now, W-H-I-T-E. He's like, what do you mean I'm white? He said, you're white now. So when uh, would it, because the information I see coming from the Pew Research Center is that most Hispanics or Latinos don't classify themselves as white. 37% classify themselves as white. So what evidence are you citing that Latinos in general as a whole classify themselves as white? One, and two, white people in general don't treat them like they're white. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the fear of the browning of America. So I know some black people who think they're white and act like they're white, but uh, no, uh-uh. That's not how they're treated. Okay, Davis Dupree said Richard Spencer, research Richard Spencer. He's the founder of the National Policy Institute. He is the white supremacist who coined the term Caucasian. I mean, not Caucasian. All right, Caucasian was coined by uh, Dr. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach in 1779. He was the head of the uh, history department at the University of Göttingen in Germany. He's the one who um, coined the term Caucasian, and he stratifies humanity into five races, if I remember correctly. Uh, Leticia said, maybe it isn't the browning of America, their lives are being exposed. No, it's the browning of America. Oh no, there's a fear. So many white people of the browning of America, and they've been largely lied to about non-European people, 
They have been taught the history of African Americans, have been taught about the real history of slavery, the contributions of African Americans to this country. You have the media uh, misrepresenting uh, African Americans, misrepresenting the history. So uh, people think that everything is our fault. We get blamed. Uh, there's a pathology uh, of, uh, of African Americans. There's a pathology of our history. Uh, there's an article that uh, you've heard me talk about before. There's a study that came out December 2017. Uh, Washington Post dot com has this article i talked about it briefly when i was on charlene mitchell's show thursday night on 9 10 a.m the superstation we broadcast it here on facebook um news 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 media offers consistently warped portrayals of black families study finds news media offers consistently warped portrayal of black families study finds okay and so you need to read this from, from Washington Post. Uh, and this deals with how people have not been taught history properly and how the negative images that we see of, uh, of African-Americans, of African people, how this impacts the way we think, feel, act, and behave, okay? Major media outlets routinely present a distorted picture of black families, portraying them as dependent and dysfunctional. While white families are more likely to be depicted as sources of stability, according to the, re to the report released by Color of Change, colorofchange.org, and uh, Family Story. Color of Change is a racial justice organization. Uh, Travis L. Dixon is a communications professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana. Champaign. Uh, he conducted the study. He said, quote, this leaves people with the opinion, the opinion that black people are plagued with self-imposed dysfunction. It's your fault you created this yourself. You created 246 years of slavery. You created decades of Jim Crow segregation, decades of redlining. You created the sharecropping system. It was you. You created the convict leasing system yourself that was used from 1865 to uh, 1928. It was you that gave away 250 million acres of land with the Homestead Act signed in the law May 20th, uh, 1862. By It wasn't a black man who signed that in the law. That was Abraham Lincoln that, that maldistributed redistributed 250 million acres of land for the next 100 years, for the next 100 years, almost exclusively went to white people and it went to white peasants coming in from Europe. The Southern Homestead Act of 1866 redistributed 45 million acres of land. The Dawes Allotment Act of 1887 redistributed 138 million acres of land. Almost all of this went into the hands of Europeans, but we get blamed for these problems. We get blamed for this. No, this is, comes from a lack of understanding of history. Yes, there's some things that we can do to make it better, but you got to deal with the history of how this happened. And this came from public policy. This came from laws. This came from politics. 246 years of slavery didn't just fall out of the sky. That was based upon policy, okay? So uh, this is why you have to understand history. This is what we deal with in the online in our online courses because, see, a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. A people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past in the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. And those that don't understand their history are destined to repeat it. Those that don't understand their history are destined to repeat it. If we actually understood the history of the Watergate break-in, June 17, 1972, which led to the uh, resignation of Richard Nixon, the first sitting U.S. president to resign from office, August 9, 1974. Then the 16.4 million African Americans who were registered to vote in the 2016 election cycle, more than 59% of them would have voted. We would have voted at the same levels that we voted at in 2012 when a record percentage of African Americans voted. It was 66% registered to vote and 2012 voted. We would vote at that same level and we would have stopped this fool. But too many people were reading the fake uh, Facebook posts that were put there by Russian trolls because Russians took out about 3,500 ads on Facebook for a total of $100,000. It reached about 124 million to 130 million people. And these ads largely sold racial discord. It played upon the racial fragmentation in this country. 
and it caused a lot of African Americans to stay at home. Plus, you have rampant voter suppression, basically unprecedented voter suppression, because we know that in addition to the 14 new voter ID laws that 14 states had, we also know that Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act was gutted. So this was the uh, because of the Supreme Court decision, 2013 Shelby County versus Holder. So we know that the 2016 presidential election cycle was the first uh, presidential election cycle that you did not have the full weight or full enforcement of the 1965 Voting Rights Act that most of us still don't even understand to this day. This is why history is so important. Such stereotypes fuel political rhetoric and inform public policy. Such stereotypes fuel political rhetoric and inform public policy, such as Congress's consideration to gut social safety net programs. They're working on that now. This article came out December 13th, 2017. They're talking about how the negative stereotypical images of African Americans in the media are then used to fuel public policy. This is why when people say, if you don't like that negative image, just turn it off. You don't, under you, you don't understand how what you read, see, and hear impacts the way you think, feel, act, and behave, and how it impacts those who are making public policy. And politics impacts every aspect of your life, from the water you drink, Flint, Michigan, to the air you breathe, Environmental Protection Agency, to the food you eat, for a, a, food, uh, a, a few, uh, food and Drug Administration, FDA. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources. Politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties, or policies, the adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. So just because you turn off that television don't mean other people do. Doesn't mean other people are not impacted by negative stereotypical images. And we used to fight back against those images because see when the movie, The Birth of a Nation came out February 8th, 1915, the NAACP led protests against that movie. NAACP was about uh, six years old. It was found in 1909. NAACP led protests against the movie. When the movie went to uh, Boston, uh, William Monroe Trotter led protests against that movie. When the movie, when the, when the play, The Klansman, uh, uh, came out in 1906 in Philadelphia, 3,000 African Americans led protests against that movie because we understood that it was, it was attacking our humanity. The movie, The Birth of a Nation, caused race riots in the streets because it, 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 it showed black men, showed white men in blackface, but it showed black men trying to rape white women. And the Ku Klux Klan was the hero of the movie. The movie is on YouTube. It's three hours long. It's a silent movie. Go watch it. This movie caused race riots in the street. We, we had a better sense and understood when we were under attack. Today, we sit up every Wednesday or Thursday and watch Empire and watch it on TV One and think it's the greatest thing. And you don't understand your humanity is under attack by that show, just as our humanity was under attack by the movie The Birth of a Nation. We had a better sense of understanding we were under attack and we took action against it. Today, the NAACP gives the gives uh, Empire image awards. In, 19, in 1915, the NAACP led protests against the movie The Birth of a Nation. But the modern day Birth of a Nation, the modern day menstrual show Empire, they give image awards to Empire. Taraji P. Henson, Won, a, won an image award uh, a couple years ago for her role as Cookie on the TV show Empire. It's like, wait a second, this doesn't even make sense. Such, you know, I'm not attacking the NAACP. I'm attacking some of. I'm, I'm, I'm critiquing some of the decisions. Okay. I'm not attacking anybody who's a member of the NAACP. There's some good work the NAACP does, their legal defense fund, so I'm not attacking them as a whole. But you, get, you just got to sit back and say, wait a second. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. This is why I say we have to stop financing our own dehumanization. Such stereotypes fuel political rhetoric and inform public policies such as Congress's consideration to, quote, to, quote, gut social safety net programs, end quote, Stricter work requirements, drug testing, and other welfare restrictions are likely to be supported by a public, exposed by a public, listen to me, drug testing and other welfare restrictions are likely to be supported by a public exposed to inaccurate portrayals of Black families 
what you read, see, and hear affects and impacts the way you think, feel, act, and behave. Legislators can point to media coverage of black families in their zeal, in their alacrity, in their zest to further limit welfare programs and say, quote, it's all their fault. They just need to get their ducks in a row, end quote, said Professor Travis L. Dixon. Poverty and welfare were not always stigmatized in the media as a predominantly African-American issue. White men who benefited from the anti-poverty programs of the 1920s and the 1930s during the Great Depression were typically thought of as having run into hard luck. Joe's just down on his luck. He just needs a hand up. However, it's just temporary. He's a good guy. And they just needed the support to, quote unquote, help them through the tough times. But over time, political leaders and the media have, quote, worked to pathologize Black families in the American imagination, negative corporate hip hop, making it rain, showing crimin promoting criminality, promiscuity, promoting drug usage in the music, promoting this in the music videos. So you got half naked women and you got money falling from the sky. Every third music video takes place in the club, many times, sometimes a strip club. And they're marketing promiscuity, they're marketing alcohol to our youth, okay? Work to path over, over time, however, political leaders and the media, quote, worked to pathologize black families in the American imagination, to justify slavery. It's all their fault. They're heathens, they're pagans, they can't stop having sex, okay? The, the slavery, the South put forth the, so it was the South that created the myth of the happy slave to justify slavery. And they said that um, the institution of slavery, the peculiar institution worked for everybody. Uh, they, they portrayed the enslaved Africans as being childlike and basically portrayed them as not being able to be self-sufficient, not being able to live on their own. So we're doing them a favor. We're taking care of them and we provide room and board for them. We provide food for them and they work on the plantation. They, they produce crops and when they're not working, they dance and sing and they perform for the masters. And they, they're looked at ex as extensions of the family, the good benevolent master. He loves his slaves. He takes good care of them. And then this civil war came and these Yankees from the North came and disrupted our whole way of life. And they, they disrupted this and now they took away our slaves and now look, the, the South is devastated. It, it's gone with the wind. This is what the movie Gone with the Wind portrays. So we have to understand the intersection of history and media as well. And see, power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own. Power is the ability to define and shape reality and have other people accept your definition of reality as if it were their own, as our brother, Dr. Wade Nobles, teaches us, who's an African Center psychologist. So over time, however, political leaders and the media have, quote, worked to pathologize black families in the American imagination to justify slavery, justify Jim Crow, justify mass incarceration, justify widespread economic inequity, and justify urban disinvestment, as well as to gain and maintain political and social power, end quote, wrote Nicole Rogers, founder of Family Story in this, in this study, okay? We, and then we look at Trump's condemnation of Chicago, but not volunteering to send resources, investment. I'm not talking about police. I'm not talking about feds. I'm talking about financial investment and resources for job programs, for schooling. They've closed over 50 schools, 50 public schools in, in uh, Chicago. OK, but then he has compassion for the opioid, addi opioid addiction because that largely hits white America. I'm not saying we shouldn't have compassion for them 
And it's not, it's not just affecting white America, it's mostly affecting white America. You have African Americans who are caught up in an opioid addiction, whether it's heroin, whether it's the pills, et cetera. But he has compassion for the opioid addiction, but no compassion for Chicago, no compassion for the killings in Chicago. All right, so check out this article from Washington Post, December 13, 2017, by Tracy Jan, J A N. News media offers consistently warped portrayals of black family study finds. And I've been studying media for 26 years. So I I def this is what I've been talking about this for 26 years. So I definitely understand it. This is why these studies are important because when you're trying to change laws, it has to be backed up by the data. It has to be backed up by the evidence. It can't be, you can't go in talking, dealing with feelings and emotions. You have to deal with facts and evidence. And this is, this is where we make a mistake, okay? All right, uh, let's continue. How's everybody doing? Um, hey, I'm Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. Follow us here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Follow us on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Um, we, um, our main topic, we started out talking about the interview that Nicki Minaj did uh, with Elle magazine published uh, June 13th, 2018. Uh, we're talking about Nicki Minaj feels responsible uh, for girls selling sex and creating modern day prostitutes. These are her words, not mine. And I asked the question, what did you think was going to happen? Okay. And then also we started talking about um, Trump and the immigration issue, et cetera, um, and um, the negative images of African-Americans in the media, which um, then uh, give a foundation or basis or justification for negative policies that uh, negatively impact African-Americans. Okay, uh, music has messages sub subliminally, Okay, subliminal messages, uh, said Davis Dupree. Uh, Erica, yes, sir, they are. Mary, oh yes, Africans are very intelligent, love our African roots. Lonnie Watson said, okay, I'm sorry, we're going to, uh, we're going to put behind the eight ball, we're going to, going to be put behind the eight ball again. We can barely stay alive. We black moms, dads, kids, uh, nowhere to stay. Uh, we the Democratic Party. Now out, out talking, working for causes, but not the Black USA cause, no votes in 2020, bet. I don't know what you're talking about. What are you talking about? Lonnie, I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. Uh, Mary said, love your t-shirt. Yeah, this is Nakia from Black Panther. Lupita Nyong'o, Lakia from Black Panther. Eric said certain artists folks can't listen to until they're age appropriate. Mary said, "I uh, Mary Boy said I used to live across the street from an African family when I lived in Germany, and he and his wife spoke three languages: their native language, English and German, just the sweetest neighbors uh, I had ever had." Lonnie said, "Yes, but uh, won't let in country." to black, to black, uh, okay. Chike Akua, Dr. Chike Akua, said he has his PhD, he earned it. Um, it wasn't a correspondence course either, he earned his PhD. He said your range of knowledge and insight and your thorough research is always inspiring. All right, thanks brother. Hey, so I'll be, Chike, are you gonna be at the uh, Liber Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo? Third weekend in July, I'll, I'll be there again. I'm one of the presenters. I'm presenting that Sunday. Um, Liberated Minds Black Homeschool and Education Expo. Visit liberatedmindsexpo.com, liberatedmindsexpo.com. If you want to uh, find out about uh, um, educating African American children, liberatedmindsexpo.com. Yeah. Um, th th this conference takes place the third weekend in July each year. Uh, this is the seventh annual conference. I've been to six of them. So uh, I'm usually one of the presenters and I'm a vendor. I'll be there again this uh, this time. My presentation, I'm presenting on Sunday. Don't know the time yet. They have me early in the day. I think I'm presenting around one or two o'clock. 
My presentation is Lessons from the Film Black Panther. Lessons from the Film Black Panther. Economic Guerrilla Warfare, Political Self-Defense, and How to Wakanda the Vote. W-A-K-A-N-D-A. W-A-K-A-N-D-A. Okay. Lessons from the Film Black Panther. Economic Guerrilla Warfare, Political Self-Defense, and How to Wakanda the Vote. All right. And uh, also, if you can't make it, don't worry. We have that... Uh, presentation available on it's already available on dvd at our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com we actually have a uh, we actually have a six dvd bundle pack i forgot to tell you uh, it's a 48 hour sale going on um it has three of my lectures dealing with the film black panther and i have a three hour presentation black panther analysis african history culture and afrofuturism but uh lessons from the film black panther is one of them and uh, there's three other presentations as well, okay? So we'll post that there. It's available at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. This is on sale, $45, regularly $75. It's a six DVD bundle pack. Okay, so Chika, Chike said, uh, I wish I could be at Liberated Minds, but I'll be in Jacksonville, Florida that weekend speaking at the Black Educators uh, Rock Conference. But Liberated Minds is the bomb. Okay, all right. So sorry you won't, won't make it this time. Okay, uh, Lonnie said, I don't know about, okay, don't know about that. Uh, educated Africans are selling out Africa. Michael said, uh, Erica, uh, he's too stupid to comprehend all those facts. Uh, Mary Bowie said, 38% from Norway are educated. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, Mary said, I got it, thank you. All right, Renee. Uh, Hattie McDaniels couldn't even accept her award because she wasn't allowed to enter the theater. No, Hattie McDaniels was allowed to enter the theater, and she had to enter the theater through the back. She accepted her award because I saw her give her acceptance speech. I saw the video of her giving her acceptance speech, so she accepted the award. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Said so audio going out. I think that was some time ago because uh, I'm going by looking at your comments. Delena said Renee Lamar, Hattie McDaniel did accept the award but she did it in a separate theater. Um, uh, now, I'm not sure if it was a separate theater. I know she had to enter the theater through the back, okay? Uh, Mary said, wow, that's awesome. I had no idea uh, we had the higher rate for being educated in the U.S. I have heard this before, uh, but you, you, you definitely explained it better, okay? Um, Erica, yes, it should be uh, percent equal pay. We got Brittany Yardy, the herb alchemist. How you doing, Brittany? Uh, Michael, she admitted to contributing to the rate of prostitution, but then drops this song titled Rich Sex. Um, she doesn't really care about how she influences the youth. The other thing we have to understand is a lot of times um, artists don't have, they don't determine which songs get put on their CDs, their management will pressure them into recording certain songs, uh, et cetera, okay? Uh, Renee Lamar said, very gracious woman, Hattie McDaniels, uh, okay. Uh, the changes in the direct relationship and the declining while population and eventual loss of majority status in America, uh, white have never exceeded 10% globally, right, okay. And uh, let's see. Okay, so check out that study. Uh, Erica, preach Michael M. Hotel. All right, thanks. It'd be sure, okay, Mary said Richard Nixon was also crazy. He just literally went insane after his mess with Watergate. Well, that was a whole lot of pressure on him, okay? <laughs> that was a whole lot of pressure on him. And it was Republicans, it was uh, elected officials, Republicans in Congress who put pressure on him to resign. They said, we've seen the evidence you're going to be found guilty in the U.S. Senate. They put pressure on him to resign from office. Okay. Um, Mary said, I need to see this movie, Birth of a Nation. Wow. Yeah, so this is the original Birth of a Nation, not Nate Parker's Birth of a Nation, but the original one from 1915. Uh, wow, interesting. Oh, I don't want, I don't watch Empire. Not taking anything from the talent, just not me. All right. Uh, okay. All right, so hey, we'll be on uh, Sunday night, the African History Network show. We're going to have uh, Professor Griff 
uh, live on the air. Uh, we're on 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. Professor Griff will be back in Detroit on Thursday, June 28th, uh, 2018. Thursday, June 28th, 2018, 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Jam Handy. The Jam Handy, located at 2900 uh, East Grand Boulevard, 2900 East Grand Boulevard in Detroit. Uh, this is celebrating the 30th anniversary of the release of Public Enemies. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. There'll uh, be performances by uh, Kyrie Frazier, Mahogany Jones. Uh, you have the Black History One-on-One -on -one Mobile Museum uh, with Khalid, uh, Khalid Al-Hakim. Uh, he'll present special artifacts, memorabilia, and music from Public Enemy. Tickets are $20 and are limited. You can uh, purchase your tickets uh, online at DetroitIsDifferent.com, DetroitIsDifferent.com, okay? And uh, we'll post the information again here, DetroitIsDifferent.com. Check that out, some positive things going on uh, in Detroit. And please drop the links for articles you cite. Did you need, did, did you get all the links, Matthew? Uh, Mary said 1915, Sunday night, 9 p.m. Yeah, yeah, we'll be on Sunday, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're on every Sunday, usually, unless I'm out of town. Uh, the African History Network show on 9, 10 a.m. Uh, the Superstation, WFDF, okay? And then remember, you can listen to the audio podcast of my shows at uh, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have the audio podcast of the shows there. and. Um, we also broadcast on uh, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep on YouTube as well. Uh, I started broadcasting live in the studio uh, on YouTube as well. All right. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, you can read my articles, listen to podcasts of the shows everything okay the last article you cited i didn't get what was the last article okay yeah return of the gods is coming up uh was it august 10th 11th and 12th in san diego Brittany? go to return of the god uh return of the gods ent.com i'll give you a link because we have a link here for the african history network when you uh purchase from our link we get a we get a cut of that, so that helps. Nobody's purchased from my link yet, so tonight will be the first time. But it's a three-day event, uh, Return to Gods. I'll be there, Professor Kaba Kamene. Uh, I'm being honored. Professor Kaba is being honored. Uh, it's hosted by Lord Jamar, a brand Nubian, uh, and uh, Rod Digger. And uh, it's organized by uh, it's Return of the Gods, uh, the Real Family, Real Family Reunion. And uh, let's see here, we'll post this. We got the Herb Alchemist, the Sister Kateria. We got, we have uh, performances. Uh, now Queen of Four will be there. Sarak, the MC of Atlanta. Uh, Chepa Key, um, uh, comedian Michael Collier. It's a whole lot of people, okay? Uh, bring the family out to have a great time, celebrating the Great Awakening. Uh, Friday, August 10th through Sunday, August 12th, okay, in San Diego. So I'll be back in L.A. I was in L.A. I was in California uh, for New Year's Eve, doing a couple lectures there. Kyle Rest Unity Center. That was December, let's see, December 31st and uh, New Year's Day. And I'll be back in San Diego um, in August, August uh, 10th through the 12th, okay. Uh, Renee said, uh, Good information, Michael. I have to take notes because it's intense. You right about that. Can't remember. I just rewatched. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, the last article. Okay, the one dealing with African American women being the most educated. That's from the root.com. We'll post that again. Black women now the most educated group in the U.S. We'll post that link again. Okay. All right. So hey, be sure to. Um, Register for the online courses I teach. They're all on demand. You don't have to worry about getting getting back home at a certain time. Uh, we put them in a bundle pack, uh, so it's affordable. It's only sixty dollars. 
It's 10 in the bundle pack. And uh, you can watch them around the world, smartphone, uh, tablet, computer. They include our 14 hour, seven session online course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach in school. It includes great African women in history, the mothers of civilization, African American resistance in the era of Donald Trump, how Richard Nixon's war on drugs was one of the African American communities. About 10, 10 courses in the bundle pack, a lot of information. Watch them over and over again. And that helps support the African History Network as well. It helps us pay the bills, keep doing the research, stay on the air. And um, also, you can donate to the African History Network if you like this type of information. Uh, if you want to, um, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. That helps us as well. Paypal.me, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. You can donate 20, 15, 25, 50, 100 dollars, whatever. And you can set up for a recurring donation if you want to, like uh, each month. And then uh, 48 hour sale going on, uh, six DVD Black Panther bundle pack as well. Now, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, because people keep asking me, when you're gonna be here in this city, when you're gonna be there in this city, well, contact me when you book me, then I'll be there, okay? So if you want me to do a, a presentation, do a lecture for your group or organization, uh, email me at info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, okay? I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and we can set it up, all right? But the next place I'll be is in Atlanta, Ju July 13th through the 15th, Friday, July 13th through Sunday, July 15th. For the, lib for the seventh annual Liberated Minds Black Home School and Education Expo. People come from around the country for this. Uh, this deals with uh, learning how to homeschool African American children. They have the experts there. Um, uh, they have all types of resources, curriculums, things like this. Liberated Minds Expo, okay. And so if you wanna learn about homeschooling African American children, or if you already do it, you wanna learn more about it, you wanna get books, DVDs, curriculums, learn from the experts. Uh, you want to be at this expo, okay? All right. Look, we got to get out of here. Hey, remember at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself it's based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Remember, right knowledge corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next time. Peace.